So it's a great pleasure to introduce this um, talk in this room um, called Core Boot and uh, Open Source BIOS Placement, I think. And this talk will be presented by Peter Stugim. Give him a well. Uh. <laughs> All right. So first of all, how many of you guys saw the talk last year I did about Corbu? Okay, maybe 15? That's good. Um, I'm not going to repeat much, so I think this should be good also for you. Just a short introduction of myself and of Coreboot. Then I want to talk about what goes on inside of Coreboot, what and, and why. And the, the short answer is we have 30 years of, of history running in our uh, PCs today. So there's a lot of stuff to take care of. I'm going to talk a little bit about the source code tree, what, um, uh, what files are in there, what directories, what the code in each directory is typically for, something about the code flow at runtime. I'm going to talk a bit about development and what you have to keep in mind if you're going to add a new board to, to Coreboot. Also, I'm also going to um, go through what has happened in the last year in Coreboot and uh, also the very exciting project Serial Ice, uh, the project CBIOS, LibPayload, Philo, and FlashROM and BIOS Extract. Some, some utilities you may recognize from before and some of them are new. Also, I'm going to say a few words about boot times because it's, it's beginning to be more popular or more and more common to see boot times advertised and um, it's, it's important to be careful there. Conclusion, some thanks and uh, the, the normal ending with links and questions. My name is Peter Stuge, as you already heard. I'm from Sweden. I do consulting in software hardware and security. I like open source. I like um, low-level embedded things. It's, it's always fun. I first discovered Coreboot in 2001. I was working on developing a setup box for my employer at the time. And I thought, okay, we, need, uh, we, we should use this. We should use this open source um, uh, firmware because we were building this setup box on a, a PC platform and um, I really wasn't interested in hacking assembler code, assembly code, um, and, and rewriting a BIOS, which was the other option. Unfortunately, that's what I ended up doing, but I stuck with Coreboot, and um, I'm, I'm still active. I uh, tried to think that our, I'd like to think that I stayed mostly silent until 2006, uh, and then I went to Hamburg at a developer meeting there and got involved a little bit more. Lately, I've been doing some kconfig stuff in Coreboot and uh, some work on the VIA VX 800 and 855 code. Also, MSR tool and support and marketing. Coreboot is an open source BIOS replacement. It's written mostly in C, as opposed to many of the uh, commercial BIOS sources, which are a lot of assembly code. It's one single code base. Uh, supporting all the chipsets and manufacturers uh, and mainboards, about 200 different vendors and about 200 uh, different components as well. Um, sorry, no, not vendors. 200 components and 200 mainboards uh, from, I guess, oh, I don't know, maybe 50 or so vendors. We have a 10-year anniversary this year. The project was started in 1999, so it's been around for a while, and uh, it started out in the cluster computing world, but it's, um, it's spread out, and it's really useful anywhere you have a PC or an x86 CPU starting up, and that's a lot of places now. Coreboot supports ACPI and system management mode for platforms that require this and people that want it. Um, it's, I think it's important to remember that Coreboot is not just an open source BIOS. It's, it's not a, a standard BIOS. It uh, brings a new concept. It separates the hardware initialization from the operating system load. And a traditional BIOS will do both of these. 
Corbett does just the hardware initialization and it's, it's new code, so legacy free, no assembly, 32-bit mode. And the bootloader is, is isolated into its own program called a payload. The payload goes into the ROM image together with Coreboot and uh, when Coreboot is done running, it jumps to the payload and the payload can really jump back. There's a whole bunch of payloads. I've talked about them before. There's Philo, GPXE. Uh, you can use a Linux kernel also as a payload and uh, do lots of fun stuff with Wi-Fi or uh, Fuse or just boot from that old card you have with, uh, without an option ROM. Memtest86 runs as a payload. How many have used Memtest86 for, for something at some point? Yes, good. <laughs> uh, I'd say that was about 65%, 70% maybe. Uh, there's also a Windows CE bootloader and lots of other payloads. We also have a, a compatibility payload called CBIOS. Uh, using that, you can boot BSD and you can boot DOS and you can boot Windows even. Um, if, if you want to. CBIOS implements all the, the standard BIOS stuff and is an open source BIOS, whereas Coreboot only does the hardware initialization. So you can combine these two and then you get an open source uh, solution, which is a really 100% replacement for, for your BIOS in many cases. And Coreboot is GPL2 licensed but because we split out the payload, you can have a bootloader with any license. It doesn't have to be GPL. It's not linked together. It's really a, a standalone binary. We've created a, um, a C library, a very small C library, to facilitate writing payloads easily called libpayload. And uh, that library is BSD licensed, so you're really free to choose how you want to distribute your, your home-made payloads, which can be useful. It's nice to put for example, an application as a payload. If you have a really simple one that doesn't need an operating system, it's going to be running pretty quickly. So what, what does Coreboot do or what does it have to do? I, I made this nice little graphic. This is a, a PC about the way it looked in 1980 when the first PCs came out. It's also when the first BIOS came out because this this cassette block here, that could be one of two uh, brands of cassette players or tape players. And depending on which one you had, you needed to access it and program it a little bit differently. So the BIOS came in in order to abstract these two tape players and you just had um, one software interface that you um, could use to bootstrap the system. And this was in 1980, and we've gone from that to something more like this um, in, in a normal PC today. And there's a lot more stuff here. So uh, this, this is showing uh, what could be a, an, um, a four CPU AMD 64 system. Uh, we have the four CPUs, you see them up top and there are, uh, there's a memory controller attached to each CPU. The memory controller has its own RAM and um, uh, besides connecting to the, uh, besides the CPUs connecting to each other, there's also a north bridge somewhere and a little bit depending on which CPU it is, the north bridge might even be integrated into the CPU. So either there's, um, this connection, um, some kind of bus between the CPU and a north bridge. It could be a front side bus, it could be just a local bus, meaning that the north bridge is actually part of the CPU. So it's, it's a bus on die if you want to, but there's no, there are no connections on the main board. Or it could be hypertransport. The north bridge has uh, often times now a graphics part with uh, uh, one, two, three, video output ports of some sort, digital, and lots of bandwidth going there. And typically the Northbridge also has a PCI Express connection. So this, and, and again, if the Northbridge is integrated with the CPU, then the PCI Express might be coming directly from the CPU.